and sisters uh, in the central Johannesburg Church of Christ region and also our visitors you are our honored guest we are so happy to have you tuning in uh, for our midweek this evening um, we are gonna pick up where our teacher Verna left off last week where he spoke about um, how caring for the weak has been a mission of God and that he went out of his way to make sure that the weak amongst the family of believers are taken care of um, in the spiritual family. The special provisions that he makes uh, for our brothers and sisters across uh, the whole region. The lesson that God has put on my heart uh, this evening to share with you is entitled Family Identity. I will share with you the importance of our identity in our spiritual family um, and that is the church and then I will do that after I have um, thoroughly prepared your heart uh, by looking at how the world sees identity and then contrasting those two ideas uh, with what the Bible says you know an article that I read on psychology today posits that identity necessarily must highlight the differences between people that what identifies you simultaneously at the same time makes you different from others and that's really how the world defines each individual this individualistic approach that what makes you different from the next person is what your identity is in contradistinction to what the bible actually says about that and so we generally as people define ourselves broadly in terms of one what others think of us what do other people say about me who do they say that i am that's the first identifier that i have and then secondly what we do maybe i'm a lawyer maybe i'm an accountant or whatever it may be um, that i do tends to define me in the long term and then thirdly and lastly, what we have, you know, the positions that I have, um, the properties that I've amassed and all that I've achieved in life, the qualifications that I have and all of that tends to be one other defining factor for most people. And so these manifest themselves in adopting wide ranging views, worldviews and amassing a lot of possessions to try and find out who we really are. But the Bible is so different to that. You know, we do different personality tests and we say maybe I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, I'm an ambivert, or whatever the case may be. And all these things have to do with what other people view me as or how other people view me as. We're gonna read uh, this evening from the book of Matthew chapter 16 and I will read verses 13 uh, to 16 which read as follows this is a declaration made by the Apostle Peter um, that Jesus is the Messiah it says in verse 13 when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples who do people say the Son of Man is they replied 
Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hyades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. What a lovely passage of scripture. In verse 13, we start off with a question that Jesus asks his disciples about the general view that people have of him. Not that he was unaware of what people were saying because we learn in the Bible that Jesus knew uh, the thoughts that people had before they said anything. But as a teachable moment, as a moment to affirm in his disciples what they had already been witnessing, and also to highlight the difference between their belief as disciples of Jesus and the beliefs of the world, the beliefs that the world had of him, the thoughts that they had of him. You know, we know from the book of Luke that Jesus had already been growing in prominence. And so people could infer his identity from some of the actions that he, he was doing. They could infer from some of the things that he was saying. He was not an insignificant fi fi figure. And fi uh, history reminds us and lets us know of that. You know, verse 14 shows us the that though opinions about Jesus were varied, if you think about it, all that people said about him was positive. They spoke of him in high regard, even though they were lost about his identity. There was no confusion about his character. There was no confusion about his teachings. There was no confusion about his actions. And so, this shows us that it says firstly that some say that you are John the Baptist and you know in the previous chapter in chapter 14 verse 2 of that chapter Herod echoed this very opinion that Jesus was reincarnated that this view was a common view from people around Jesus at the time he had to have come back from the dead because of his miraculous powers. He had to have come back from the dead because of his words, his wisdom. And that's what Herod uh, echoed uh, in that verse. Secondly, the Bible says that others say Elijah. You know, this view aligns itself with a prophecy in Malachi chapter 4 uh, and in verse 5, where God promised to send him before the judgment day that is elijah and if you were a devout jew you would know this this would be something that you would be looking out for and jesus certainly had some of the hallmarks of that prophet and then thirdly still others say jeremiah you know in jeremiah 1 verse 10 the bible says that See, today I appoint you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So because of that, it's not inconceivable to see that out of fear, out of concern, and out of the knowledge that some of these guys had, some would have looked at the Lord's miracles and thought about the overthrowing and uprooting of their civilization as they knew it. And then lastly, the Bible says, some said that Jesus 
was one of the prophets. Yet another honorable idea about the Messiah, but still far too short of his glory. You know, it would have been great to be a prophet at that time, having gone through the test and having passed it, but still far too short of who Jesus truly was. People were looking for a box to put Jesus in. They were looking for some kind of way to identify him, to define him that was limited to what they knew, that was limited to how they usually would define people. An identity that showed regard, but that could never live up to who he truly was, to who he truly is, unless and until they had an intimate walk and relationship with the Lord. But you know, I have a question this evening. How do you see Jesus? What about you? Jesus asks in verse 15, he says, Who do you, my disciples, say I am? The disciples had to be aware at that moment that they were not the same as the world. Their view could not line up with the view that the world had. They couldn't say that Jesus is one of the prophets. They couldn't say that Jesus was the reincarnation of John the Baptist. They couldn't say that Jesus was the prophet Jeremiah. They had to attest to the existence of a relationship that they had with the Lord. They had to look beyond what the world has uh, viewed Jesus as. So similarly today, we can't be ignorant or erroneous or blind followers. You know, we need to answer that question differently when Jesus turns to us. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. That's who Jesus is. And as Peter rightly points out in verse 16, our Savior and our Father. In verse 17, the Bible goes on. It refers, it refers to flesh and blood. A reference to a man, a physical person. For Jesus says, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. It was not revealed to you by a person. It was revealed to you by the internal nature of who Jesus was. Not by the physical person that you saw in him. You know, that's the view that we are supposed to have as disciples when we look at Jesus. Not just as a physical person, but an internal being who embodies the Holy Spirit in contradistinction to the world. That's what we ought to look at, beyond the flesh and blood, but in the scriptures instead, in the Holy Spirit and in truth, when we're trying to define our Lord and Savior. Now, ancient cities at the time had walls around them, and the gates of the city, at the gates of the city, you would find the courts, the places of business, the parliaments, um, and all those high-profile places that people would go to. So Jesus refers to the gates of Hyades not being able to hold back. Here, he refers to councils. He refers to evil purposes. He refers to everything designed against him in verse 18 that all of those things will not be able to hold his church back, the family of God back. So because Peter called Jesus by a name that is expressive of his true character, that is expressive of Jesus outside of his physical body, that he is the Messiah, Jesus then in turn calls Peter by a name that is expressive of his character as well. He says, you are rock, you are Peter, 
he expresses this by saying, your character, you have shown stable convictions. You have shown yourself stern and firm. And so you are rock. And it's upon this faith, upon this rock, upon this conviction, this type of conviction, that I will build my church. The Lord says an emphatic I in the scripture that he will build his church. It is not us, it's not our responsibility to build the church, it is his. It is not the job of disciples to build the Lord's church. It is God's responsibility. And sure, he uses our skills, our capabilities, our uniqueness, our charisma, and all of that that you have. But ultimately, it is he who builds the church. He is the master builder. He is the founder. And he reminds us of that, that the church family has been founded by God. It has not been founded by us. And then he gives Peter this cool uh, responsibility to be the first to have the keys to spread the gospel, to open the door to the message of the gospel of his son to the Gentiles. And in, and in Acts chapter 10, he, he, see, he preaches the, the, the message, the truth, the gospel truth to Cornelius and his neighbor for the first time who were Gentiles. With his power and authority of access, you know, the keys unto their salvation. And that's what the Bible teaches us there. Finally, the scripture talks about the binding and the loosing, which means to forbid and to allow. And this is an authority that was given to the apostles over the church family our family that we call the church. You know, as the apostles put pen to paper, they had divine authority. They were guided by Jesus and the teaching. They were guided by the Holy Spirit to organize and to direct our spiritual family, the church. It is these principles upon which we must build and upon which we must get our identity as Christians. Not what others say, not how did the world define us, not, how, not what we have and what we've amassed and all of that, but it's these definitions, these principles that are laid out for us in the Bible. Now let us wrap up this lesson by turning to the book of Ephesians and we'll read there from chapter 2. Um, I'll read verses 19 and 20. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The word translated the strangers in the original text, it surely means people who are not citizens. While the word translated foreigners refers to guests in a private home. People who are not related by blood to the family of the house. In the church, we are all citizens. And we are related by our commonality, that is Christ our Lord. He speaks about the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. The apostles, of course, form part of the New Testament, and the prophets form part of the Old Testament. So it basically says to us that this church family is built on the foundation of the Bible as a whole, and that this gives us the right to family, the right and the right to citizenship. So here, world views in the church, philosophies, traditions, human laws, individuality, 
self-image preferences, capabilities, personality differences are put aside. All these things are put aside for the building and unification of the family of God. And really, he is the one that builds this. For if we had gone with our different views, our different personalities, Lord knows we would have gone our separate ways. So the family of God necessarily needs the foundation of the Bible. God builds this family and he does it through us though. On the foundation of the Bible, on the foundation of his son Jesus. And he gives us to Jesus as a gift to the son, without which Jesus and the Bible, without which all this edifice that we have, that we call the church family, would fall apart. So I've put, it, I've put together a questionnaire um, this evening to help us to look deeper into how we can identify more with God's vision of his family despite the differences that we have. I do hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Um, you know, having laid the foundation, we will delve into the purpose and mission of our spiritual family on our next midweek service. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have had um, to look into your scriptures, to know about the identity uh, that we have in the spiritual family. I pray, Lord, that you may help us to search our hearts so that our identity aligns with what you talk about in your scriptures, uh, and that being separate from what the world identifies us as, as individuals. But that, Lord, you may help us to see that the bigger part of our identity is connected to other uh, believers in the body of the church. Father, we thank you for this lesson that you have shared with us. And I pray that it's a, it's a foundation um, for what we're going to learn uh, in the next coming weeks uh, when we talk about our purpose, our mission as the church and the identity that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us, and we pray all this for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.